Hello everyone, I am Emily George Beliveau from the Miami University Alumni Association. Today we are proud to feature a webinar on the Stonewall Riots as part of the last day of Pride Month. Your instructor today is Dr. Eric Jensen. Dr. Jensen studies modern German and European history with a particular focus on the society, culture, and politics of the interwar period. He graduated from Harvard with a Bachelor of Arts degree and continued on to receive a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. We are thankful to Dr. Jensen for taking the time to join us this evening. You'll also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking the ask a question button. We will have three breaks in the presentation to go over new questions on the presentation. Questions and experiences that were submitted prior to tonight were sent to Dr. Jensen to work into his presentation. Today's webinar will last about an hour and 15 minutes. And with that, I will turn it over to Eric. All right, thank you, Emily. And thank you to all of you who are tuning in. This is a tremendous honor to be able to talk to you at the end of Pride Month about the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. And I think it's an especially exciting time to give this talk on the 50th anniversary of the first Gay Pride March in New York City on June 28, 1970. So one year after the Stonewall Uprisings, we had the first Gay Pride March commemorating that event. And it's also exciting because I am talking to you now just two weeks after the Supreme Court's Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia ruling that extended the 1964 Civil Rights Act to protect gay and transgender Americans in the workplace. So for my talk this evening, I'm going to borrow an approach from maybe an unexpected source. I'm gonna borrow an approach from an historian of China, a guy by the name of Paul Cohen, who wrote a book about the Boxer Rebellion titled History in Three Keys. And Cohen used key in the musical sense of the word. The key is a structural system that creates meaning for any given set of musical notes. And Cohen argued that history has keys too. History has structural systems that give meaning to an historical moment. And the three keys that he explored in his book were history as event, that was the first key, history as experience, the second key, and history as myth, which was the third key. Um, so today I'm gonna to borrow those three approaches. And uh, I wanna bring up the next slide too, just as a kind of a precursor to what I'm about to talk about. Uh, the slide is the LGBTQ activist, Marsha P. Johnson. Um, she is front and center in this picture. The reason I wanna bring up Mar Marsha P. Johnson is not only was she a seminal figure in um, the LGBTQ rights movement, but she also happens to be today's Google Doodle, if any of you are, well, I'm sure, how could any of you not have Googled at some point today? Um, she was absolutely instrumental in the early gay rights movement. What's also interesting is she reveals one of the small myths that I think has circulated around Stonewall. Many have claimed that, that Marsha P. Johnson was the first person to throw uh, a shot glass at the Stonewall uprising, and Johnson herself claimed in an interview to have been uptown during the night of protests at Stonewall, uh, arrived at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, Johnson was absolutely present on the second night and she was absolutely central to founding the Gay Liberation Front just a week later, uh, and then later brought in another very prominent activist, uh, trans activist and drag queen uh, by the name of Sylvia Rivera. But I wanted to bring her in as kind of, not only an illustration of one of the keys in which we remember the Stonewall uprising, but also because uh, Google has remembered Marsha P. Johnson today. So I will talk about the Stonewall uprising in these three keys, as event, as an experience, and as a myth. I also wanna put Stonewall in an international context as well as a national one, because the Stonewall uprising has taken on a very interesting global resonance in the larger LGBTQ movement. So I'm gonna start by talking about the event, including the situation of LGBTQ people in New York City and in the United States prior to the Stonewall Uprising in June, 1969. I will briefly describe what precipitated the uprising, what happened during it, and what happened afterward. 
And then I'm going to take a little break for uh, questions, and I'll answer some of the questions that you have posed already. And Emily will have some more, hopefully, from you. And I will then share just a couple of experiences of LGBTQ people at the time, describing how they lived through this moment and made sense of it. This is also another opportunity for you all to send in your experiences of being LGBTQ at Miami afterward, regardless of when that was, of when you first heard about Stonewall, about when you first became aware of LGBTQ rights, when you went to your first march, when you went to your first protest, anything you'd like to share. I am especially curious to hear what you all experienced. And then finally, I'm gonna conclude by looking at the myth of Stonewall, by which I mean simply how subsequent generations have interpreted the significance of the event and celebrated its impact. And here, myth simply refers to a particular framing of the moment that necessarily excludes other moments that were also important, but didn't fit within that frame. And I wanna look at some of those moments that we have sometimes left out of the frame when we talk about Stonewall. And I wanna add just in conclusion that uh, to this little introductory part, all histories can contain elements of myth. So I'm not saying that there are these conspiracies or lies surrounding Stonewall, but just that Stonewall, like every historical event, has been framed in a very particular way. And it's also interesting to think about what was left outside of that frame. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, Stonewall as the event. And I wanna set up a little bit of context, what was going on prior to 1969 in the United States and particularly in New York City. So the start of, or the time of the Stonewall Uprising in 1969, sexual relations between two men or sexual relations between two women were illegal in every single state in the country, except for the state of Illinois. Um, they actually um, discarded that part of their criminal code in 1962. And they did it at the suggestion, it's very interesting, there was a larger suggested overhaul of criminal codes. And there was an effort on the part of the federal government to kind of equalize and normalize the legal situation in all of these states. And it took a long time for these states to begin to adopt these kind of equalized standards. Illinois was the first state to do so. Um, and if I could get a, a, a slide uh, that has a great picket sign. Um, this was uh, a picket sign from 1965. This was organized by these two very early, um, they referred to themselves as homophile uh, organizations. One was the Mattachine Society for uh, Men, and the other was the Daughters of Belitis for Women. And this is Frank Kameny, uh, who was uh, just you know one of the seminal figures in the pre-Stonewall LGBTQ rights movement. And the sign says, homosexual American citizens our last oppressed national minority. Um, I, I, I'll say that I don't think they were the last, unfortunately, as events recently have shown, like by no means were other national minorities not oppressed in 1965. But nevertheless, it speaks to a very particular framing that he had that this is this one group that has been so thoroughly legally marginalized and legally excluded from enjoying the rights of the United States, that this is the last group that has absolutely no legal standing in our judicial system. So on top of this legal marginalization, at the time of the Stonewall Uprising, the American Psychiatric Association had only just the year before, in 1968, reclassified homosexuality as a quote unquote, sexual deviation. And believe it or not, that was an improvement. Uh, it was an improvement over the earlier classification of homosexuality as a quote unquote, sociopathic personality disturbance, which had been the diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual since 1952. So not only were they marginalized legally, they were marginalized um, uh, and psychologically. We, we were seen to have a disorder. Uh, gays and lesbians could not serve openly in the military at the time of Stonewall. Not only that, but President Eisenhower had issued the Executive Order 10450 in 1953, which investigated LGBTQ folks in the federal workforce and fired them. In fact, 
Franklin Kameny, the guy we just saw in that protest slide, had been an astronomer for the federal government when he was fired under Executive Order 10450. Uh, and this is what um, motivated him to uh, to found uh, the Mattachine Society, or to work with the Mattachine Society, has already been founded. The FBI considered gays in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, as representing nearly as much of a threat to the United States as communists, and also a closely related one. It was often assumed that if you were communist, you may also be homosexual. Certainly, if you're a homosexual, you were thought to have sympathies with the communists. And what's so telling, I think, about this situation, especially by the, the late 1960s, is that this stayed the case even at the height of the sexual revolution in the United States. Even at that moment in the late 60s and early 1970s, when other areas of American society were liberalizing in terms of sexual rights, same-sex relations continued to remain outside the scope of legal liberalization. And I just want to give you a couple of examples. And here I'm borrowing from the historian Mark Stein, who has looked at a series of landmark Supreme Court cases in the area of sexual relations during this period, during the sexual revolution. And he argues that same sex expression was the one area that the court refused to liberalize. So for instance, you had Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, which legalized birth control for use in marital relationships. The following year, you had Fannie Hill v. Massachusetts, which narrowed the definitions of obscenity. The following year, you had Loving v. Virginia, I actually have a slide for that, which struck down prohibitions on inter inter interracial marriage. Um, and I have a slide that shows um, uh, Mildred and Richard Loving. Um, this was the, at the uh, at the time of the announcement of the, the court case. Uh, in 1972, you had Eisenstadt v. Baird, which extended the Griswold ruling to protect unmarried couples' access to birth control. And then, of course, most famously, you had Roe v. Wade in 1973, which both discerned and anchored a constitutional right to privacy. And so you had all of these landmark decisions that were liberalizing the realm of sexual expression and sexual freedom in the United States. But the one glaring exception, as Mark Stein points out, came in the midst of all of these sexually progressive rulings. And that was in 1967. And that was the ruling Boutelier v. the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And in that particular case, in a six to three decision, the court held that homosexual aliens could be excluded and deported from the country and here's the clincher, under the quote unquote psychopathic personality provisions of the 1952 Immigration and Nation Nationality Act. And by the way, even the three dissenting uh, court justices, even in their opinion, they expressed strongly uh, anti-gay viewpoints. And what makes this even more telling, I think, not only that this ruling came in the midst of the sexual revolution in the United States, but it also came at the same time as some other parts of the world had actually begun to liberalize their laws governing LGBTQ individuals and same-sex intimacy. So for example, in 1967, the same year that this Supreme Court ruling came down um, uh, referring to uh, gay people as having psychopathic personality disorder, uh, Britain decriminalized homosexual acts as part of a sweeping package of legal reforms. Canada did the exact same thing in the exact same year, in December of 1967. And this was also in the context of a larger legal reform bill. I wanted to include this uh, quotation. This was Pierre Trudeau who went on to become Prime Minister of Canada. He was Justice Minister at the time and he famously stated at the time of this liberalization of, uh, of Canadian laws, quote, there's no place for the state in the bedroom of the nation. Uh, West Germany, decriminalized most, most forms of same-sex sexual expression. Two years later in 1969, interestingly enough, uh, their liberalization, by the way, also as part of an overall omnibus legal reform package, took place on June 25th, just three days before the Stonewall uprising. And then maybe I'll just, I'll finally, I'll just add France because France is always interesting. France's legal code had actually made no mention of sexual relations between consenting adults whatsoever since the French Revolution in 1791. They still would occasionally crack down on uh, LGBTQ people 
um, on other charges, but as far as France was concerned, um, <laughs> the, the nation, the, the, um, the, uh, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation ever since, uh, ever since two years after the storming of the Bastille. So in other words, what I wanted to point out here is not only are American attitudes toward gay rights um, a little bit of an exception in the late 60s in comparison to this larger liberalization that went along with the sexual revolution in the US, but that also um, the United States was starting to slip behind many of its peer democracies at the same time in terms of guaranteeing sexual liberty for every consenting adult. Now, most nations in the world continued to criminalize sex between two men and two women. But if you think of Canada, Britain, West Germany, and France as four of our peer democracies, as democracies that we measure ourselves against, here we see the United States starting to slip behind already by the late 1960s. Okay, so that's like the legal context uh, for gay people uh, in the late 1960s. What was gay life like in the 1960s under this particular American legal regime? Well, if you lived in a big city, such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New Orleans, or New York, then bars were absolutely central to whatever gay life you might have. I love this uh, slide. These are uh, six um, matchbooks that were actually collected by um, a guy I'm gonna to refer to later on in the, in the talk, Gerald Pinkney, from uh, different gay bars in, uh, in New York City. And given the dearth of LGBTQ organizations and publications, Bars really served as the main source of information and socializing, as well as one of the very few places where you could meet other LGBTQ people at the time. And I thought there was a really interesting analogy made by an early gay rights leader by the name of Dick Leitch. And he once said that gay bars were to gay men back then what churches were to blacks in the South. In other words, it was the one place where a person felt safe, felt protected, and felt free. Um, and that was true of gay women too, at least in New York City, which um, had several women-only lesbian bars. Um, and by the way, if you're interested at all in kind of the lesbian bar scene in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, the author Mary Jane Meeker writes in wonderful detail about this in her memoir. You can see the book cover right there, Highsmith, The Romance of the 1960s. She went out for two years with um, the novelist Patricia Highsmith, who um, was famous for writing The Talented Mr. Ripley and, and several other novels, including some iconic lesbian uh, novels. So gay bars occupied uh, a very important place in the gay community, um, such as there was a gay community in the late 1960s, but gay bars also occupied a very shadowy legal status as well. And this was true even in a relatively permissive place like New York. The New York State Liquor Authority regarded homosexuals as inherently, quote unquote, disorderly, and bars that knowingly served LGBTQ customers could have their licenses revoked. It was not a law, but it was a clearly understood, unwritten rule. And so as a result of this kind of shadowy legal status that gay bars occupied in the city, organized crime got heavily involved in running gay bars and paying off police and paying off the liquor authority to make sure that they weren't raided or more likely that they were raided on a very predictable schedule so that uh, the bars could plan accordingly. And so organized crime ran not only most of the gay bars in the city, that, but they ran almost all of the gay bars in the neighborhood of Greenwich Village, which was where a lot of queer people lived and socialized then and now. And so I slide the exterior of the Stonewall Inn because this was absolutely the case for the Stonewall Inn too, which the Genovese family purchased in 1966. It had originally been a straight bar. They restyled it from a straight bar to a gay one in 1967 because it was more profitable for them, for their purposes. Uh, the Stonewall did not have a liquor license and instead occupied as a private quote unquote bottle club. Uh, drinks there were watered down by a bottle club. You, you, you signed a, a little piece of paper and you basically joined a, a member, you became a membership to the club for that evening once you once you entered uh, once you entered the premises, uh, drinks were watered down. Prices were incredibly steep. Police raids still occurred, albeit with a little bit of forewarning, and usually during off times 
um, when people who were in the know or who had paid off uh, the mafia could be informed to, to stay away. Um, and the mafia also, by the way, paid out the police to organize and regulate um, uh, these police raids for the most part. I, mean, I say for the most part, because there's about to be an exception coming up. Nevertheless, so despite the, <laughs> the watered down drinks, the overpriced uh, um, uh, cocktail menu, the fact that there were raids and the fact that it was really kind of a dreary place. If you ever listen to people like reminisce about the Stonewall Inn, they, they talk about, you know, no one cleaned the toilets. It was just kind of dank. It was like, you know, it's just like, it was not a super pleasant place to be, but it provided a sanctuary of, of sorts. It was a place where you could meet other people and, and socialize and feel relatively safe. Okay, so now I'm going to get to the particular context of 1969. And what's so interesting about 1969, there are a lot of things going on nationwide, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Something very particular was happening in New York City, and that was a mayoral election was taking place in November 1969. And not surprisingly, this is true of, of mayoral elections uh, everywhere still to this day, when a mayor is running for re-election, uh, he or she likes to look for a very kind of invigorating platform on which to run. And one of the surefire ways of generating a lot of votes is to say, I am tough on crime. I have cleaned up the city. And sure enough, the incumbent mayor, John Lindsay, faced a tough fight for a second term in 1969. And sure enough, his campaign decided to focus on Lindsay's efforts to quote unquote, clean up the city. And this included targeting purported places of urban vice. And that absolutely included gay bars. And this is where the police would sometimes not warn the mafia, despite the payoffs, because they also wanted to make a big show of these large arrests that would be splashed all over these newspapers. And then Mayor Lindsay could say, look at how tough I am on, you know, these, you know, kind of this, this urban vice, look at how I'm cleaning up the city of New York. So when police conducted raids on gay bars, uh, they drew on all sorts of obscure and subjective legal infractions. Um, this time uh, in the raid on Stonewall, they drew on uh, violations of an 1845 New York law that criminalized masquerading. And by the way, um, California had a similar law and this was also used in a series of raids on LA gay bars, also in the 1960s. So the idea was if you were masquerading, um, this was a violation of this 1845 law. And if you were a man wearing women's clothing, that was by definition masquerading. So this was regularly used to target drag queens and trans people in particular. And so the first people to be arrested, the first people to be targeted uh, during the Stonewall sweep on June 27th to 28th, uh, were were trans people and and drag queens, um, and so this was the context in which on the night of fr Friday, June twenty seventh, and Saturday, June twenty eighth, police raided the Stonewall Inn. They expected it to be a regular, a relatively by the books raid. I mean, they had just raided another gay bar, another very prominent gay bar the week before. It went off more or less without a hitch. They'd arrested about a dozen people. It got the requisite coverage in a certain section of the newspaper and John Lindsay could say, look, I'm cleaning up the city. This time, however, the patrons fought back and they were led by drag queens and trans people who were the most easily and directly targeted by police arrests. And they were very quickly joined in by other patrons. And this is uh, a photograph uh, from the second night. There's almost nothing from the first night. I mean, you know, no one, no one was prepared. Uh, for this to happen. There are very few photographs, period, of, of this particular uh, weekend event. Um, the second night, people knew that something was going on and um, there were people who were a little bit more cognizant about recording it. But the first night, this was totally spontaneous. And so there's almost nothing other than people's eyewitness testimonies uh, in terms of what went on. So, you know, one of the questions is why? Okay, why Why this time did they resist? Why this time did they fight back? Um, well, let me, first of all, question the premise of the question that I just asked. Um, in fact, there have been lots of instances when gay people had fought back. And I'm gonna bring up some more later on at the end of the talk. I'm gonna talk about some of these protests that were left outside the frame. It was actually not that uncommon for, uh, for queer people 
to fight back or to resist arrest or to throw things or to, to taunt the police or, or to resist in various ways. But why was it so much more pronounced this time? Why did it move from just protesting to, I think it's safe to call it a, an uprising, even a revolution people often refer to, the Stonewall Revolution. It's impossible to know what exactly catalyzed this really intense resistance, especially since, you know, as I said, a similar raid had happened the week before. It had gone off relatively without a hitch. Um, you know, there, there seemed to have been no rhyme or reason uh, in terms of when people would fight back or when they wouldn't in, in, in earlier cases. Participants in the resistance um, definitely included a wide cross-section of the LGBTQ community at the time, uh, drag queens, uh, people of color, trans people, teens, older men. In other words, there are a lot of people who are marginalized from society in a number of different ways, not just because of, uh, of, their, uh, of their sexual orientation. Um, that certainly played a role. Uh, a lot of people who were eyewitnesses uh, and who participated in that first night mentioned the hot and humid weather. Hot and humid weather always makes tempers flare up. Uh, they describe a gathering momentum of people simply refusing to submit to the police. And this momentum prompted more patrons to join in. So it's really interesting. It just, you know, when you look at, at, at how crowds work, it just takes a couple of people to put up a fight. And then more and more people will join in, um, in many ways, just to support and to defend those people who are putting up the fight. And then more people will join in to defend the people who are defending the people. And pretty soon you have this momentum that is propelling this protest. Uh, forward. Um, and very quickly, people were chanting, uh, they were throwing things, they were rocking police vehicles. Um, and the more they did that, the more empowered people felt. Uh, and the more people from the bar and from the neighborhood, this was a very heavily queer neighborhood, the more people from the neighborhood began to join them. Um, to the point that the police actually felt overwhelmed and threatened by this crowd, the police actually barricaded themselves inside the Stonewall Inn and allowed the protesters uh, to control the street. The police actually had to call reinforcements simply to evacuate themselves uh, from the Stonewall Inn. So word spread very quickly of the successful resistance uh, to this police raid. And so the following day, even more people gathered at the Stonewall Inn to to see what was gonna go on, but also to kind of continue this energized protest. Um, the police returned to, um, this time prepared for more of a fight. Uh, the confrontation grew more violent. And the crowd this time also included people who did not necessarily identify as LGBTQ, but who either wished to show solidarity with this particular group, with this movement, or who had their own grievances against the police. And there were a lot of people in New York who had a lot of grievances against the police. So it became kind of this gathering spot for people who just wanted to express their frustration with, uh, with uh, how they were being policed in the summer of 1969. So I want to show you two slides. This, I think, is a really interesting one. This is from the Mattachine Society. One of the big beefs against the Mattachine Society is the Mattachine Society was um, radical LGBTQ people referred to it as accommodationist. They, they saw it as too moderate. And here you see an example of that. This is written uh, just outside the Stonewall Inn. And it says, we homosexuals plead with our people to please help maintain peaceful and quiet conduct on the streets of the village signed the Mattachine Society. So they were, they were pleading for a certain amount of reserve. They didn't they didn't want this to get out of hand. And to some extent, they were absolutely right. They didn't want people to get hurt. They didn't want there to be um, to be violence. They were absolutely on board with this large agenda. I wanna show you the second one too. Um, the second slide, um, this is some, some graffiti that also happened at the time. What I love about this little particular piece of graffiti, uh, graffito, um, is that it's already making a plea to potential allies of the LGBTQ community. Because there's a piece of graffiti that's not saying, look, we're oppressed, we're gonna fight back. But it's basically saying, everyone in New York City has an, and an interest in this particular rights movement because gay prohibition corrupts cops and feeds the mafia. And what they meant is like, look, as long as we are this marginalized community, the mafia are gonna be running the bars, they're gonna be paying off the cops, and we're gonna have this cycle of corruption continue. So if you care about cleaning up the city, as Mayor Lindsay claims he does, you should be supporting us and not supporting the police against us. By, by liberating us, you are 
cleaning up the city by removing this ideal source of corruption. So I, I just love that, that already they're framing it to, to frame LGBTQ rights as beneficial to all of society. Everyone gains when LGBTQ people have their rights. So within a couple of days, LGBTQ leaders had organized a meeting of nearly 400 people to talk about how to proceed. Martha Shelley, who was the president of the New York City chapter of the lesbian organization Daughters of Belitis, that I mentioned briefly a little bit earlier, she proposed a protest march in the village to take place a couple of weeks later. And her proposal was unanimously accepted. So this is really interesting, not just that there's a, a, an additional protest march happening a couple of weeks after the fact. This is also, by the way, not the first time this had happened, as I'm gonna point out later. But what is really interesting is a committee formed to plan that march and the committee decided like, wait a minute, we don't wanna just be a march committee. We wanna be a really radical LGBTQ rights committee. And here they were explicitly reacting against what they saw as the too conservative approach or the too accommodation, accommodationist approach of these pre-existing organizations, the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Belitis. And so they reconstituted themselves as the Gay Liberation Front. And it was more radical, more vocal, more energized than any queer organization that had previously existed in the United States. And it became the driving force behind a new movement for gay rights, first in New York City uh, and then nationwide. Already by October 1969, you had a Gay Liberation Front um, coming together in San Francisco and organizing a first protest there. That was a protest against the San Francisco Examiner for the San Francisco Examiner's coverage of gay bars. And a friend of mine uh, who was in at the University of Wisconsin, Madison at the time, remembered posters for the GLF, the Gay Li Liberation Front, already showing up in Madison in spring 1970. Not surprising because Madison was a hotbed of, of protest activity. And this is one of these early uh, gatherings of these groups. It says Gay Liberation now for the Gay Liberation Front. Uh, the organizing and protests following the Stonewall Uprising did more to finally put LGBTQ issues on the national agenda than any other previous moment had. Um, and here I want to show um, a Time Magazine cover uh, from October 31st, 1969. Uh, it says the homosexual in America, and if you read it, uh, there had been there had been earlier magazine coverage of um, of LGBTQ people, but it was usually either sensationalized or sort of pathologizing, like oh, you know, look at you know, let's God forbid this should happen to any of us. Look at these poor you know benighted people who are living in the shadows of society. This was one of the few and one of the earliest examples of a nationwide magazine giving relatively, relatively uh, sympathetic coverage to the issue and talking about the movement for LGBTQ rights for the first time. So this was a, a really big deal. And then I just wanna conclude this section by, um, by noting that the real seminal moment I think came actually on the first anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising because that was when you really began to get a sense of this movement has legs, this movement, this, this is it. This is going to be this permanent movement that is gonna continually push. It is not gonna go away. Um, and that happened on Sunday, June 28th, 1970, 50 years ago, um, this past Sunday, the first gay pride parade assembled at Christopher Street and Sixth Avenue and it marched up to Central Park with signs that read gay power. And here's a poster announcing it. They were posted all over uh, the village. And organizers who had planned this march only expected a few hundred people, but actually several thousand people ultimately took part. Um, and there's a, a great poster for it, Christopher Street Gay um, Liberation Day, 1970. Um, one of my advisors on the dissertation committee was a graduate student at Cornell University in Ithaca at the time, and he remembered taking a bus overnight, Friday night to Saturday morning, arriving in New York City on Saturday morning, so he and another group of, of queer students from Cornell could take part in, in this march. They're actually, interestingly enough, sponsored by the Quaker Church. The Quaker Church has a very interesting history of, of supporting LGBTQ rights. 
And so I just want to conclude this section uh, by, um, by noting that I think what made 1969 different, what made this protest develop into something more, develop into a movement that had legs, um, was a combination of the drama of the event. Um, it was an incredibly dramatic event. It lasted not just one night, but an entire weekend, actually a couple of, of several more days after, um, after the initial protests. Um, the initiative of key people was absolutely key to start creating networks and organizations in the immediate aftermath of the event. We're not gonna let this energy peter away. We're gonna harness this energy and create something lasting. And then finally, of course, um, situating Stonewall in the larger context of social movements in the United States that energized and empowered people to make demands as citizens, both through the ballot box and in public demonstrations. Uh, we saw that in the civil rights movement, which by the way, in the late 1960s is when it moved from the South to the North and began targeting cities like Chicago and New York and Detroit and Minneapolis and Boston and places like that, which also happened to have uh, relatively large invisible uh, gay communities. It was, um, uh, the uh, the height of the, the women's movement, of course, uh, of the uh, anti-war movement and the student movement as well. And so I'm gonna pause here and uh, get a drink of tea. And Emily, um, do you have additional questions? Yeah, well, I have a couple experiences and um, mm. questions came through. Um, for experiences, one person wrote in, my wife and I got married in Massachusetts in 2014 before it was even legal in Ohio. It's been great to take my twin daughters to the Rainbow Parade the last couple of years and appreciate the differences since I first went 15 years ago. So sweet. Um, and another experience, as a student at Miami University, I was heavily involved in Spectrum. As a group, we attended the protests in the pouring rain at Cincinnati Town Hall in response to the passage of Proposition 8 in California. Margaret Cho was in town to perform stand-up but she stood in the rain with us and led us in a protest against inequality. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, you know, I would add too, because you had sent me that experience beforehand and I looked it up and the, the news report that I found said that it was actually students at Xavier, UC and Miami that had organized that protest. So there's a very direct Miami uh, connection to, I remember going there and like, yeah, Margaret Cho, like which was very funny, but I mean, she was mostly very moving then, but that that is such a great memory. That's great. Um, um, sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Did you have uh, questions as well? Yeah, we have a few questions coming. And just as a reminder to folks that are watching right now, you can easily ask a question right on that button underneath the video that you're viewing. Um, and they all are all anonymous too. Um, so for questions, one came through a minute ago and said, after my 1970 graduation and entering the military, I was stationed in Germany in the mid 1970s. Although I don't recall hearing about the Stonewall riots at the time, I do recall hearing it mentioned during the Leonard Matlovich case. I was surprised at how open Germany and Europe was about homosexuality. Interesting, since the Nazis targeted them for extermination. When did Germany and Europe become more liberal and open about this? Great question, yeah. Actually, it's interesting that he, uh, this person mentioned uh, Leonard Matlovich too, because I believe he was also on the cover of Time Magazine in like 1975, I think this was one of the second or third covers they'd done on, on homosexuality. Um, so when did Germany become, it was basically, it was basically 1969 as well. I had mentioned that legal reform that they did and it's so funny, it's, it's so, in some ways it's so typically German or, or you know, typically very you know, rigorously European. Canada did the same thing. It was just part of an omnibus legal reform bill. The German justice minister decided, you know what, it's time to go through all of our criminal codes and kind of update them and figure out like, you know, what we need to keep and what we don't need to keep. And they came across uh, paragraph 175, which had been on the German legal, um, in the legal criminal code since 1871 um, and had, had actually been tightened under the Nazis in 1935 to uh, include a paragraph A of paragraph 175. And paragraph 175 was what was used to uh, target uh, gay men mostly. Um, uh, very few women were targeted, it was mostly uh, homosexual men. Uh, after the war, West Germany kept it on the books. Uh, East Germany actually liberalized much more quickly um, and West Germany, they didn't 
they didn't have, obviously they didn't have concentration camps. They didn't kill anyone, but they imprisoned as many people in the 20 years after the Second World War as had been imprisoned in the entirety of the Nazi regime. So this is a kind of a black mark on the West German government. And it was in 1969 in the context of this just omnibus legal reform that, you know, some bureaucrats in the justice ministry said like, you know, this, this particular like tightening of the measure doesn't really make sense. And this age of consent seems like it's a little high, let's, like let's lower this. And it was the beginning of, of several, it took multiple reforms of that law. It was finally struck down in the early 2000s. It was completely eliminated from the books uh, altogether. But already in, in 1969, 1970, uh, Germany was remarkably uh, tolerant place for um, LGBTQ people in general. And we'll say especially West Berlin. West Berlin was like, it was a little bit like Greenwich Village or San Francisco. It was like this haven for, um, for pacifists and, and uh, all sorts of people who, who wanted to just kind of get away from it all. So it's referred to as the island surrounded by East Germany. Awesome. Yeah, I'm a historian, I could talk forever about German, about West German legal reforms. Anyway. <laughs> um, one person asked, what was the name of the bar that was raided the weekend before Stonewall? Oh, that is such a good question. And I, I don't know. I wish I knew. Uh, I have the names of a couple more bars in LA that were raided. I just remember um, in one of the oral histories, I can't remember whose it was, Someone said, like, yeah, just the week before, you know, they'd done a raid and it went off without a hit. Because um, they were talking about, like, what they were trying to, to reflect as well on what what was it? What was the special sauce that made this such a different moment than, you know, I mean, raids took place all the time of, of gay bars. Um, yeah, I wish they knew. If I look it up, if I find it, I'll send it to Emily. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, someone asked, which you might get to later, what parallels can be drawn from the actions and the impact of the Stonewall riot to the current protests against police brutality in support of the Black Lives Matter movement? How can these lessons be utilized today that are learned from Stonewall? Oh, it's such a good question. Yeah, I will get to that a little bit more later. I, I will just add one quick story because it is interesting in both cases that police become, you know, the, the, the targets and the lightning rods because the police themselves had been, you know, sort of targeting, you know, LGBTQ people, I mean, and black people in the 1960s, let's be honest. And, you know, and obviously um, um, continuously uh, black people uh, since then, uh, which has been the driving force behind Black Lives Matter. And it's interesting when you hear some of the, um, the personal reflections of people who were at the Stonewall protests, just the visceral hatred they have of the police as an institution um, and as an entity, because so many of them had been arrested multiple times, they'd been humiliated, they'd been called names by the police, their names were printed in the newspapers as a further way of humiliating them. They were mocked by the police, they were treated poorly at the station. I mean, they just, you just felt this like bitter loathing. And I remember um, there was an, actually an, a great American experience documentary about Stonewall, if anyone um, has a chance to watch it. And one guy says, um, on that first night of the protest, he said, like, you know, he thought that it would have been possible that some of the police would have been killed. And he said, like, I probably would have been one of the people to do it because he had been treated so horribly in so many previous arrests by the police that he just was burning with with fury. So, um, so I mean, there's some really interesting parallels there, but also the way in which, you know, the police are just a manifestation of this larger systemic homophobia and this larger systemic racism. It's, it's not just that this one institution is the locus of this particular prejudice. It's just a symptom of this larger society-wide um, prejudice. We've had quite a few questions roll in, so this is great. I'm oh sorry, <laughs> all of them. Um, but Aya from the class of 1984, is a member of the PFLAG in New York City and the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance, um, working to ensure the rights of Asian immigrant, queer, and trans people and make sure that they're protected. Um, they are curious as to why Marsha P. Johnson was not welcomed by the LGBTQ community in the first Pride event. And a lot of folks have actually asked questions about Marsha P. Johnson. So I was wondering if you could reiterate a little bit more about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, 
you know, <laughs> this, so now I'm going to uh, pour a little cold water on my comment about um, the Gay Liberation Front being a much more radical organization. Well, it was. It was a much more radical organization than the Manichean Society and the Daughters of Belitis. Maybe I can trace this as a trajectory. So that first picket sign I showed you with Frank Kameny in 1965, that was actually in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And for five years in a row on July 4th, 1965, 66, 67, 68, and 69, the Manichean Society and the Daughters of Belitis had organized a picket in front of Independence Hall picketing for the rights of homosexuals. Totally gutsy move in the middle and late 1960s, but also the way in which the protest was undertaken speaks to the incredibly um, conservative tactics that were adopted by these two organizations. So you can see right there, um, uh, at the insistence of Frank Kameny and Dick Leitch and, and several of the other organizers, all of the men had to wear suits and pants, all of the women had to wear skirts and dresses, everybody had to be on their best behavior, everybody had to have neatly trimmed hair, everybody had to look neat and presentable. Um, this was precisely part of this accommodationism that the Gay Liberation Front was rebelling against in 1969 when they formed their group and then organized the first gay pride parade in 1970. And yet, for them too, there were still aspects of the queer community that were a bridge too far for them. And they were, there were still people in this early gay pride movement who were made incredibly uncomfortable by people who, um, by trans people, by, uh, by drag queens, by drag kings, by uh, people who wore um, quote unquote outrageous costumes, by people who wore hardly any costumes at all and were like, you know, um, un, you know, practically undressed or wearing just like, you know, leather shorts. Th there was still this anxiety about like presenting this movement in a respectable manner so as not to, you know, sort of alienate middle America. And, you know, I mean, I can understand, I absolutely can understand that, that, that motivation. They were thinking very tactically and very strategically, but, you know, the, the part that gets left out is they ended up marginalizing precisely some of these people who had been so instrumental in getting the movement going in the first place and marginalizing some of the people who so wanted to be a part of the community and in fact were a part of the community and were, were so instrumental in the community behind the scenes but were not allowed on stage so to speak that were they can be instrumental in the in the in the movement behind the scenes but you know we don't want them on the floats where they're going to be broadcast on um a nationwide television and i mean I, I, my sense is that's not really an issue now, but I remember, you know, when I started going to my first gay pride parades in the early 1990s, that was absolutely a tension. And you could, you could feel it either in comments by the organizers or in asides by people themselves who are marching. Like, you know, look, why did these people have to come? Like, oh God, why are they doing that? Like, you know, what, is, you know, what is my mom going to think if she's, you know, she's watching this parade? So there's, there's always, I think there's always been that tension and, um, and you know, it's, it's incredibly, it's, it's understandable and it's also incredibly sad and also in, 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 in very angering because, you know, precisely the people, like I said, who are so central in these early moments and were so, you know, giving, I mean, everybody who describes Marsha, Marsha P. Johnson describes her as just, you know, endlessly caring and, and mothering Except when she was, we, when she was in her persona as Malcolm, when she was not in as when she was as Malcolm and not Marsha P. Johnson. Apparently, she'd be a little difficult. But um, just this incredibly, you know, generous, um, kind, seminal person. So yeah, I, that would that 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 would be what I would that would be what I would say. Um, and my sense, I'd be curious what people have to to say about that and what they remember, because my my memories of the 1990s were that. That was absolutely still a tension and a concern and um, an anxiety, actually. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> Emily? Yeah. Uh, I <laughs> will. I, are, are, do you have a question? Sorry. 
I'm going to hold off on questions right now um, so that we can keep it going. Um, and I know that a lot have just come in, so I'm going to look for similarities in questions and um, we'll ask those the next round. Oh, great, great. Okay, so I just wanted to share a couple of other experiences, um, and then I'm going to get to the to the to the um, to the myth part. Um, so one of my favorite one of my favorite recollections of Stonewall actually came from Martha Shelley, uh, and this was in a 2003 interview that she did for the Voices of Feminism Oral History Project. And there's there's Martha Shelley right there, and she so she recalled like. She, like I said, she was head of the, the New York City chapter of the Daughters of Elitist. And so these two women were coming down from Boston that weekend because they were going to start uh, Daughters of Elitist chapter up in New England. And, you know, they wanted to find out from Martha Shelley, like, how do you organize this? And, and Martha Shelley was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to give them a tour of, of Christopher Street, which is the heart of the LGBTQ uh, neighborhood. And so she gives them a tour on the night of Saturday, June 28th, 1969. This is the second night of the protest. And she has no idea that, that, that this is going on. And as they walked near the Stonewall Inn, they saw like all of these people like, like throwing stuff at the police. They're just throwing you know, shot glasses and they're flipping fingers at the police. They're rocking police vehicles. And the visiting Bostonians were like, uh, what's going on? And so like, who didn't know what was going on said like oh it's just a protest that happens here all the time not knowing like that she had just witnessed like really the birth of uh of you know the the second wave of the lgbtq movement that she herself would be instrumental in just like three days later she would be at this this famous meeting of like 400 people where she would suggest let's let's do a march to commemorate it like two weeks later so i just i just love that because it it, it you know it illustrates it reminds us again you know this age of Twitter and texting and whatever that like you know it, 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 news news certainly traveled fast but not not as fast as it does these days and you know it wasn't until later that she had any idea what was going on um, and then the other thing I wanted to share is what strikes me from reading a lot of recollections of those who participated was that they experienced Stonewall the protests as a moment of identity building. And a lot of them say they became aware for the first time of being in a shared community with their, with their fellow bar patrons um, as a result of this protest, which I thought was really interesting um, because it suggests up until that point, you, know, you would go to these bars and you understood that there was some, you had something in common with these people, but you didn't necessarily see it as the community. You saw them as maybe someone you might want to talk to and maybe sleep with or maybe strike up a conversation with but you didn't necessarily feel yourself as part of a community. And they said that really, that weekend changed that. They began to think of these people differently, even people they weren't interested in, whatever, dating or talking to, or um, they, they saw it as still kind of a part of themselves. And obviously in relation to what we were just talking about, there were limits to that, you know, as we would see during the, the, uh, the pride marches. Um, but nevertheless, an expanding sense of community, at least I'll say that, um, was a necessary precondition for creating a movement. And then maybe the last thing I will add, well, two more things uh, for the experience part. Um, it was, you know, this creation of a movement that also enabled political coalitions. And I'm really struck by one of the recollections of the author, Dale Pinckney, and there's Dale Pinckney. He was, actually, he was not at Stonewall. Um, but he remembered seeing the Gay Liberation Front marchers in, in war demonstrations that he started to attend in the early 1970s. And what I thought was especially interesting is he specifically recalled that Huey Newton had urged the Black Panther Party to work with LGBTQ activists. So you can already see there in the early 1970s kind of this coalition, this political coalition building between different movements and different groups. Um, that would build into into something you know much larger into these common agendas, especially the movement for civil rights and the movement um, uh, against the war. And I just wanted to, I wanted to share one last thing. This was an experience that had been sent in by one of you earlier, and it was someone who wrote, "I came out in 1990 and played softball for Team Cincinnati uh, in the Gay Games, the third Gay Games in Vancouver that year." And then this person wrote, also in 1990, I was part of the community resistance to the shutdown of the Robert, Robert Mapplethorpe exhibit at the Community Arts Center in Cincinnati, um, which I think is a wonderful example also of activism here in Cincinnati. But it reminded me, speaking of art museums and exhibitions, 
uh, of the fact that Miami University's Art Museum has one of the largest collections of work by the gay artist Paul Cadmus. And I didn't have time to pull a slide in of one of Paul Cadmus's paintings to include in this. But he, he was active in the 40s and 50s, and he did like really erotic stuff. Like if, if any of you have seen like Tom of Finland, it was kind of Tom of Finland-esque. Uh, and Miami University happened to have one of the largest collections of his works, um, thanks to a, a guy who lived in Oxford at the time, actually the editor of the Oxford Press, for those of you who remember that newspaper. Um, and Miami University's Art Museum put on the first ever retrospective of Paul Cadmus's work back in 1991. And I would love it if any alumni who are listening right now, if you were at Miami in 1991, 1981, 81, and remember going to that exhibition, I would love to hear what you remember about it. And whether, whether there were protests or whether people were like just embracing it, whether your instructors took you there on a class tour or anything. So let me know that. Um, okay, uh, let's go into myth and then we'll have time for more questions and absolutely feel free to ask questions uh, as they occur to you. So I think that the Stonewall Uprising was absolutely a transformative historical moment, um, especially because of the emotional power of what it represented. The emergence of a community that was increasingly visible and that felt increasingly empowered. And I want to say without hesitation, the Stonewall Uprising was the central moment in the LGBTQ rights movement in America. But it was not the only one, nor was it the first one, even though the public generally marks June 1969 as the start of the gay rights movement. So here I have a slide that actually illustrates that. So um, in June 2016, uh, the federal government designated the Stonewall in um, a national monument. And if you can see on the, the monument, uh, on that plaque there, it says, quote, the Stonewall Inn was the birth of the modern lesbian and gay rights liberation. And it was absolutely the critical moment, but I, I wonder what is left out of the frame when you, when you refer to it just as the birth, because there are a lot of moments that happened before it. Um, just very quickly, I'll mention this guy, Henry Gerber, who started the very first gay periodical in the United States, Chicago in the 1920s. And he started it, speaking of Germany again, he was an occupation soldier after the First World War in Western Germany and had seen one of the many gay publications that existed in Germany in the 1920s during the Weimar Republic, brought it back, translated it into English, and decided, I'm going to do something like this for the United States after one issue was shut down um, uh, by the U.S. Postal Service. But um, for, for one brief stunning moment in the 1920s, we had uh, the only gay publication in the world outside of Germany. So that's a feather in our cap, I guess. Short of lived as it may have been. Um, one of my other favorite stories about an early gay publication um, uh, happened in 1947, and this was the second LGBTQ publication in the U.S. It was this lesbian newsletter that went by the title Vice Versa, and it was an entirely one-woman production by a secretary at RKO Studios in 1947 named Edith Beattie who would type each issue on nine carbon copies. I just love this story because, again, we were talking about technology, like, you know, before Twitter, like Martha Shelley had no idea that, like, Stonewall was going on. Okay, so this is before you had, like, Xerox machines. Edith Eady would take the master sheet and nine carbon copies, and she would make about nine issues of this newsletter, vice versa, and then she would pass them to her friends, and then her friends would pass them to their friends. It's basically like a newsletter tree that just, like, and disperse out into this lesbian community in Los Angeles. The other thing I love about this story is she got this she got this gig at RKO Studios and her boss said, like, look, I don't have that much work for you to do, but you've got to look busy. I don't want you to just be like sitting around like, you know, whatever, like during the crossword puzzle or reading a book. You've got to look busy. <laughs> so this was what inspired this woman to like, oh, she's like, okay, great. <laughs> I'm going to write a newsletter and give it to all my friends. I just love that story of, of just like grassroots, um, grassroots activism, but also grassroots newspaper publishing. Um, 
uh, three years later, 1950. By the way, a lot of this is happening out in, in California. So California, in many ways, is, is, is the birthplace of a lot of what is happening in the gay rights movement. In 1950, Harry Hay founded the Manicheen Society in Los Angeles. Related to the police, he founded the Manicheen Society specifically to fight against police entrapment. So initially, this was a one-issue organization. It was constituted solely to combat police entrapment. And then as the group um, continued to meet, they began to expand their purview into um, a larger agenda of, of gay rights. This is a poster from the New York chapter of the Manicheen Society. This is from, um, this is from 1963. Um, I just love that. I also love, like, you can see the, the, the phone number with the, the letter prefix down there. You had to write or call. Um, I, in 1955, Phyllis Lyne and Del Martin joined together with three other lesbian couples to found the Daughters of Elitis. Oftentimes, that's considered a, a counterpart to the Madison Society. It was the earliest lesbian political organization in the United States, also in San Francisco. And they published the newsletter, the latter, beginning in 1956. Um, by the way, uh, the Madison Society produced a magazine as well, one, uh, starting in 1953. But what I really am interested in is there were a number of protests against police crackdowns in California uh, throughout the 1960s, and they were not unlike what occurred at the Stonewall Inn in 1969. And one of the earliest ones that people know about uh, was in 1959. There was what came to be known as the Cooper Donuts Riot. Um, and this is something that the author John Reshi wrote about his 1963 novel, City of the Night. If you ever want to read that, it's just interesting story of, a, of an urban uh, uh, street hustler. Um, but Cooper Donuts was located in downtown LA between uh, two gay bars and become this popular hangout uh, for LGBTQ people after bars closed or in between bars. Um, and the police would regularly crack down on, on people who hung out there. And when two police officers stopped one evening to ask patrons for their IDs in May 1959, the guests started throwing cups and donuts at them. And John Reshi immortalized this in his novel. So, you know, it was a protest that had some afterlife, at least in literature. Um, a much more organized protest occurred uh, eight years later at the Black Cat, and that was a tavern on Sunset Boulevard in the neighborhood of Silver Lake in, in LA. And the police showed up on New Year's Day, 1967. So 1966 to 67, so it's a couple years in the 1967. And they arrested 14 people for same-sex kissing to ring in the new year. And the patrons decided to stage a march. And so over a month later, they gathered together. So it wasn't just a protest at the moment. It was actually an organized march following the event, which is what I find so extraordinary, because they, they had to organize this by a phone tree. Um, and on February 11, 1967, dozens gathered in front of the bar with picket signs to protest the police raid. And the other thing I find so significant about that moment is it was actually that event and then the subsequent protests on February 11th that led to the founding of the Advocate magazine, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, it was originally just an, a Los Angeles-based magazine, but in 1969, in the context of Stonewall, the Advocate went nationwide and it soon became like the premier um, uh, magazine, especially for gay men, but it gradually expanded to be LGBTQ in general. Um, and then the last one I wanted to show you, this was from, this was the, um, yeah, you won't be able to see the details of it, but I want to, I want to point out, if you look down at the bottom, this would have been below the fold, for those of you, for those of you who remember paper copies of newspapers, this is a 1967 New York Times cover, and I love that headline, it says, Episcopal clergymen here call homosexuality morally neutral. And it's just to show that there were actually constituted bodies that were not themselves directly invested in LGBTQ rights, who were beginning to speak out against discrimination of, against LGBTQ people. And this was two years before Stonewall, and it made it onto the front page of the New York Times. So they were, there were other groups, sympathetic groups, I also mentioned the Quakers, who were kind of putting this issue onto the national agenda. Um, and there are a lot more protests that I could have mentioned. That, um, if anyone has ever read the work by the, the trans historian Susan Stryker, she writes a lot about the Compton's Cafeteria riot in San Francisco in August 1966. There was a sit-in at 
at Julius's bar in Manhattan in 1966. Julius's bar is the bar that is shown at the very beginning of the film, The Boys in the Band, if anyone has ever seen that film. Um, and it was actually as a result of that sit-in that the New York State Liquor Authority issued an explicit notification that no, we have never had a law saying that you must deny um, alcohol to someone who is openly homosexual. They had, but they were compelled to issue that statement to, to kind of countermand their unwritten regulation or their unwritten policy as a result of this event. Um, there's a flower protest at the Patch Dance Club in LA in 1968. And then there was this, like, you know, I still think it's really gutsy that they, these annual marches on July 4th in front of Lipinus Hall, they, you know, as conservative and buttoned down and quote unquote accommodation as the Manatee Society and the Brothers of Belize were, you know, it took, took a lot of courage to get up there and, and march for an hour and a half in front of Independence Hall on July 4th for the TV cameras. Um, but the Stonewall Uprising mattered more. And just to, to go back to it, I think it was a combination of the drama of the event. Um, there's, we love a protest. We love something that we can call an uprising. And that is empowering and it's galvanizing. And movements want to feel empowered. They want to, they want to, they want to have a heroic moment that they can point to. And this is a heroic, heroic moment for LGBTQ people. Um, it was a result of, uh, absolutely of key individuals. Um, not just who were at the protest itself, but who preceded it. People like um, uh, Del Martin and, and Phyllis Lyon, people like Edith, e Edith Eby, who took out those nine carbon copies and hand-tied vice versa. Um, they are absolutely instrumental. People like Marsha P. Johnson, who was active in the community, such as it existed long before Stonewall and continued to be active until she died. Um, uh, people like uh, Bayard Rustin, who was active in the civil rights movement and was openly gay. Writers like Tennessee Williams and Carson McCullers and uh, James Baldwin uh, and Truman Capote. Um, and then finally, you know, it, there is something to be said about 1969 as this kind of magical moment in the United States in the context of these larger social movements that energized and empowered people to make demands as citizens. It was happening on college campuses. It was happening in anti-war protests. It was happening as the civil rights movement moved north uh, from the south. It was happening in the women's movement. Uh, it was happening in the LGBTQ rights movement. It was happening in a second surge in the labor movement. There was absolutely something energizing about the late 1960s that I think contributed to the electricity uh, uh, of Stonewall. Um, Oh, one last thing I just wanted to mention that I think is so cool because you know it speaks to like the, the importance of a dramatic event. So a couple, one of you had mentioned already that you uh, were stationed as a military um, uh, as a military person in West Germany. One of the things I find so interesting about Germany is they did not, in some ways, they were ahead of us, right? Because they liberalized their laws. Three days before Stonewall, and you know, and it took us a long time. I mean, we didn't really catch up on our laws until Lawrence v. Texas, right? Like they'd already liberalized them three days before Stonewall, and it still took us, not, you know, almost uh, 35 years afterward uh, before we um, before we actually liberalized our laws to the point where Germany was. And yet, it's the power of the dramatic event. It, it's hard to commemorate a bureaucratic legal omnibus reform package that doesn't like inspire people. And so to this day, if you go to a gay pride parade in Germany, they call it Christopher Street Day. <laughs> so this was one, this was the 30th anniversary of this would have been uh, 1999. This is uh, Christopher Street Day in München. This is at Munich. Um, every single German city calls it Christopher Street Day or CSD. Berlin has a huge CSD. And it is because there's something inspiring about Stonewall. Even when West Germany had already passed that moment, you know, they didn't really need Stonewall to motivate like a legal. Um, I mean, they still had, by the way, a, a queer rights movement in the 1970s that was absolutely instrumental in continuing to liberalize their laws, but they didn't have that dramatic moment. They wanted to have that dramatic moment. So every year they appropriate our dramatic moment and celebrate it over there as this like global LGBTQ rights moment, which I just think is so beautiful and international. And global, it's like a global LGBTQ plus hug. So, um, uh, for the alumni questions, I really do want to, to 
to get a little bit at these parallels that can be drawn from the actions and impact of the Stonewall uprising to the current protest against police brutality today. So just to point out some of the historical parallels again, the role of police in policing and the way in which different communities can feel targeted by police rather than protected by them. I think that is such an important parallel. And the number of, of LGBTQ people who said, like, I would never seek protection from a police officer. I would run from a police officer. These, these people were there to persecute me, not to protect me. And the way in that has continued to echo um, in, uh, in the Black community, especially among Black men to this day. Um, also, the historical intersections uh, and cooperation between communities of color and the queer community, I think, is really interesting. Joe Pinckney, I already mentioned, had, had noted that Dewey Newton had called for cooperation between the Black Panthers and the Gay Liberation Front. But Daryl Pinckney, whose father was super active in the um, NAACP, also recalled at one point finding in his father's papers the draft of a resolution that he figures his father must have submitted to an NAACP subcommittee in 1984, and it called for the NAACP to support AIDS patients who were losing their insurance. Um, and so in the 1980s, at a moment when probably more so than they had been since 1969, queer people were again being marginalized, you see again a group like the NAACP reaching out and building bridges and, and making this call for, for solidarity. Um, and I will say America as a whole has been realizing recently that both the movement of LGBTQ rights and um, Black Lives Matter affect all of us. Um, and I think this is such an important realization that um, denying liberties and rights to some diminishes the liberty enjoyed by all of us. And I think that is something that both movements have done such a great job of articulating. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, actually, I think it's a little bit painful, and I think it, it comes to the point that one of um, the alumni had mentioned earlier. Um, at the same time, I think it really is really important to acknowledge that there is systemic racism within the queer community itself. Um, and I would say that this is one area where queer communities um, really need to support this work, both showing solidarity with Black Lives Matter, but also to, to turn inward a little bit too, and to think about the ways in which the queer community has also been complicit in systemic racism. And just to give one example, um, uh, Grindr, which is a, a, a very popular uh, gay um, social and socializing and dating app, um, has finally announced that they will they will eliminate this kind of preference that you can indicate that will filter out um, certain people who self-identify as, as a certain race. Um, and the fact that that was in there, I think, is just one manifestation of, of the racism within the queer community that I think is still really needs to be addressed. And, um, and I, I, I hope this is a moment when, when that happens as well. Emily. <laughs> yes. Um, just to be respectful of everyone's time, I'll have two more questions and share one more personal experience. Oh, wonderful. Um, if anyone needs to hop off, this will be available mm -hmm. to view later online. Um, and Eric, are you okay with continuing to keep going? Absolutely. Yes. I just want to remember this all. First question. There is a lot of popular queer narrative that ties the death of Judy Garland to the Stonewall uprising <laughs> or reality. Well, okay. So, um, first of all, I, there are some myths that I think are wonderful myths, and maybe this is one of them. Like, I, there's nothing. That I have the, the 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 eyewitnesses that I have read. You know, after the fact, some people said like, "Oh, yeah, you know, we were <laughs> we were honoring, you know, we were we were mourning, you know, um, Judy Garland's death." You know, there are some people who are super keen on puncturing that as a myth. It doesn't, it does not seem to play much of a role at all. It is absolutely true that Judy Garland's funeral took place that day um, on the Upper East Side of, of Manhattan. So it was not that far away. And then the other thing I'll say, I mean, first of all, there's, I mean, there's, that, that's a myth where I feel like there's nothing wrong with that. And it's kind of a, a beautiful thing, maybe, because it makes people feel good. But also, um, there are as many reasons for protesting and being involved in the Stonewall Uprising as there were protesters and people who were rising up at Stonewall. And I have no doubt in my mind that 
a couple of them, some of them, maybe several of them, many of them probably had this in the back of their mind, or at least they were aware that she had just been buried and that was certainly playing into their emotion. So um, yeah, maybe that's all I'll say. I, a lot of people are keen on de debunking that. It does seem as a larger explanatory framework, it doesn't seem to be that big a factor, but I say there's nothing wrong with it. And I am sure that there were some people who were there for Judy. Another one said, while visiting a friend in New York City in December, we dropped by the Stonewall Inn to play pool and hang out for a bit. The Stonewall Inn appeared to be one of the only LGBTQ businesses operated by the queer community. Many LGBTQ businesses were closed. Do you have any thoughts about the decline of LGBTQ bars and restaurants in New York City, San Francisco, et cetera? Personally, they miss them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is really, it's its like the loss of a, a, of a certain type of community, um, you know, and I think it, it really has been tied to the rise of the social apps and dating apps. You know, I hear these conflicting things because I, I, I knew someone who actually worked for, um, for Scruff, which is another of these social dating apps, and he was pretty insistent that for a while these social dating apps were actually um, helping bars become more popular because people could go to the bar and log on to the app. And then within like 50 feet, you know, you were guaranteed to have like, whatever, 75 people show up on your cell phone. And if you were one of these people who suffered from social anxiety, it was much easier to text them to, than to actually go up and talk to them in person. That may have been the case for the first couple of years. There may have been like this effect where initially people would actually go to the bars with the apps and it actually made the bars more popular. But I think ultimately it has had this kind of withering away effect of the bars. I will also say like, you know, the, the decline of the bars, other sociologists have attributed it to the, you know, we're a victim of our own success. Like, you know, LGBTQ people had become so mainstream, like, you know, any place could potentially be a gay bar, like, you know, and we can feel comfortable anywhere. We, you know, there's, there's less of an imperative that we have our own space, although, as the, the the questioner said, like you know, a lot of people do still want that space. Um, and I will point out just one last thing: in Cincinnati, at least, there is this effort to resurrect it, or there was until COVID. Um, a couple of guys started this um, monthly tea dance that kind of resurrects a very 1950s, a very pre-Stonewall tradition of having afternoon tea dances that were supposed to evade the eyes of the police and the uh, police uh, raids. Um, and they've revived that on, you know, one Sunday a month from four to seven. I don't know when that'll, when we'll be able to gather together again like that. But um, but I think that's like kind of a cool development. And there is supposed to be another new gay bar actually owned by the same people opening downtown again oof, with COVID, who knows? I mean, if you if you thought the gay bars were in trouble with the social apps, like COVID may just COVID may just be the end of it for at least for a while. That's a depressing note to end on. Let's no, no. Really, really save us, end on something good. I'll take you home with a beautiful experience that someone shared. Um, someone says, I started to come out at Miami during my final year on campus in 1994. While I was already near the end of my time at Miami, I was envious of those slightly younger than I was who were already out and proud. In fact, several young gay students whom I had befriended and even had crushes on traveled to New York City in late June 1994 to mark the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. For years after, I was very jealous that I hadn't been out enough at the time to have taken part in that with them. During the 1990s, like so many, I gradually came out more and more to friends and family, helping making the 90s gay. I've had the honor of meeting Frank Kameni and Larry Kramer and befriending some of their peers who fought in the early LGBTQ rights movement. They are my heroes and they have paved the way for me and all of us. I later served for nearly seven years as an out member in the Obama administration. Today, I am comfortably out to all and I'm proud uncle to nieces and nephews who wear their pride shirts every June in honor of their uncle. All who fought for the fight from the middle of the 20th century and onward have made all of this possible for me. And I am so grateful. P.S. Last June, I not only attended the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots and international pride in New York City, but drank and danced inside the stone wall with one of my best friends who happens to have been my very first boyfriend. It was a blast. 
Ah, awesome. Very beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, and as a reminder, the recording of this presentation will be available on our website later tonight. Um, if you had to leave for some of the portion of it. And we did want to thank Dr. Jensen again for leading this webinar this evening. Um, and we hope that you take a look at our other great webinars coming up this summer on MiamiAlum.org. So thank you, Eric. And thank you, everyone who tuned in tonight. Uh, thank you, guys. And yeah, have a good evening. <laughs> Happy Pride. Happy Pride. <laughs>